Douglas Gresham, the stepson of C.S. Lewis, once shared an anecdote. It does not take place in the Christian West, nor in the modern world. It takes place in the pagan past, and in a polytheistic world. The chief characters in the plot of this anecdote are not chivalric Christian knights, nor are they Douglas Gresham's stepfather, C.S. Lewis, or his good friend Tolkien. Instead, the chief characters in this plot are savage warlords. The story takes place during the reign of Alexander the Great, the Macedonian king who in his 30s wept because there were no more worlds to conquer. Alexander was part genius, part ruthless tyrant. Certainly, on one hand, a patron of the rise of Hellenism, the spread of Greek interests in reason and education. Alexander slept with a copy of Homer, supposedly under his pillow. And yet, at the same time, was a figure who had no problem shedding blood for his conquests. A voracious appetite for expanding his conquests he even marched into northern India, trying to spread his vision of a one-world order. But interestingly enough, the anecdote takes place late in the evening, when Alexander is looking at his troops, spying his soldiers one by one. He looks down at the sentry, the watchman, the guard who is at duty. Now, the penalty for a guard falling asleep in the ancient world was death, because, of course, the survival of the entire pack or community depended on whether that watchman was awake or asleep. This watchman was regrettably asleep. Alexander, perhaps in the flush of his pride, walks up to this sleeping man and wakes him. This man awakes to discover himself staring into the eyes of his commander, his captain, and his king. And Alexander asks the watchman, Sir, what is your name? The watchman responds, My name is Alexander. Now angry, Alexander the Great responds again, shaking the watchman. I said, Sir, what is your name? The watchman responds a second time, My name is Alexander. A third time, exasperated, believing that he is having some kind of joke played on him. The great commander asks the watchman, Sir, what is your name? The watchman responds, My name is Alexander. And in that moment, the great king, looking into the eyes of his subject, seeing himself in the man that he is about to potentially condemn to death, looks with mercy and says, Well then, soldier, either change your name or change your character, and walks away. For Douglas Gresham, this kind of nominalism, this kind of name-only Christianity, is something which he absolutely finds indicative of the church in the 21st century. And for Gresham, he sees in this anecdote a call for us to remain awake at our post as we seek to be disciples of the one who has told us to have our lamps burning when the master, when the bridegroom returns to the door. What was funny is, when Gresham mentioned this story, my mind turned to Mark chapter 14, the famous plot when Jesus enters into the Garden of Gethsemane. And there he says to Peter, James, and John, his inner circle, stay here while I pray a little while. And after he does this and returns, he finds that Peter, James, and John have fallen asleep, for their eyes have grown heavy. He does this once, twice, three times, and they still have fallen asleep. 
And Jesus rhetorically asks, Could you not watch one hour with me? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And what is unique about this idea is, without the grace of God, we are all like Peter, James, and John in Gethsemane. Because no one of us can bear the weight of all the sins of the world. Only God incarnate, Christ, can. And so we are called, like Alexander the Great, in this wonderful anecdote, to look upon our brother or our sister or our neighbor, and like the Good Samaritan, to see ourselves in the person who is bleeding and wounded on the road. I applaud those in the world right now who have concern for the suffering families who are in the Ukraine, for those widows and orphans who we've seen on our television screens. I record this in the year 2022, the very dawn of April, in the heart of the conflict. And long after this conflict is over and these words remain, I do applaud people's generosity and concern. But our own streets, our own family members, and our own friendships, and our own relationships with one another are often also subject to invisible violence, subject to times where we prioritize our own work or career, or perhaps our own inner circle, to the need to be an outreaching voice of love and of compassion. And so, just as we are seeking to show concern to those afar off. Let us also, my hope deeply is, as Gresham's example gives us voice, an opportunity to be vehicles of divine mercy to those who are near us as well. What I find remarkable is that if we look at the life of Lewis, we see a man who is very well aware of his own faults and made fun of them sufficiently. In fact, Gresham offers another anecdote I find quite amusing. Tolkien and Lewis are supposedly walking. And they come across a person who's begging for change. And Lewis instinctively reaches deep into his pockets and gives the man everything. And Tolkien, one of Lewis's friends, asks Lewis, well, why did you do that? You know he's just going to spend it all on drink anyway. And Lewis's response is, well, that is exactly what I was going to spend it on. So it becomes an occasion for being able to, to poke fun at ourselves and to recognize that ultimately it doesn't matter whether the charity we are sharing is going to be utilized or not. The question is, are we still willing to be voices for that charity? I find that one of the elements in the life of Luther that I've been deeply surprised by. We all know Luther, towards the end of his life, uh, was deeply weighed down by a lot of the pressures he had experienced and could be quite snarky, frankly, with a lot of his opponents. And we know that he had a very sharp rhetorical wit. But the opportunities early in Luther's career towards a lot of dialogue and one of the most surprising examples I found was a discovery that there was a figure named Michael the Deacon who came from the Ethiopian Orthodox Church who heard about this reformer and wanted to figure out how orthodox these reforms were. And in 1535 sat down with Luther, this African deacon in a European world. And upon going over what presumably must have been forms of the Augsburg Confession, or some confessional statements, Michael the Deacon concluded that the reforms were fairly orthodox. And this representative from a branch of Christianity, from a different continent and a different world, could sit down and find charity, could find commonality. Luther would open up communion to the Orthodox faith at that one point. Now, later on there would be a falling out, as we, we know, uh, particularly with the Archbishop, I believe, of Constantinople. What's unique about this unique, unusual episode 
was an opportunity for brothers and sisters to gather together at the table of fellowship and once again find agape, find commonality, find what is shared. Another element which is quite interesting, when C.S. Lewis's wife, Joy, was presumably dying, and this was the first go around before her remission, Lewis had come to the conclusion, though he had married her legally earlier so that Joy could stay in the country. Joy was an American expatriate, but uh, her visa was up, and the only way she could stay in the country um, couldn't come through any other means. And Lewis made the bold step of legally marrying Joy, who then was a close friend and confidant, um, on paper, although they weren't yet a romantic pairing. But after Joy came down with a terrible cancer, um, their relationship blossomed. And on what could have been her deathbed on that occasion, Lewis decided to propose to her and she said yes. What's amazing is because Joy was a divorcee, initially the response of the Anglican Church was quite negative. Initially one of the local presbyters, one of the local Anglican priests, did not want to carry out the marriage at all. And Lewis hounded the man, and finally one of the local priests relented. And in perhaps one of the most unusual but beautiful weddings of all time, there at a hospital table, uh, Joy Davidman, Joy Gresham became Mrs. C.S. Lewis, Joy Lewis. And of course, as Gresham records the story, the stepson, that priest went back to his superior, his bishop. And the bishop supposedly gave him a horrible time initially. Don't you see that we need to keep up morality? Don't you need... Don't you see that we need to keep up our standards? Don't you see what is written in the scripture clearly about the uh, validity of marriage? It's, it's sacred state. But the minister, the priest, responded simply that he did what was in accordance with his heart, in accordance, once again, with charity, the agape, the self-sacrificial love. And ultimately, according to uh, Douglas Gresham, the bishop relented and said, yes, you did right. You did right in the end. And I would argue that it is that very boldness for us to reach across the divide, like that minister, that allows us as Christians to see those in front of us, not as members of some kind of legal metadrama, but instead as fellow members of the same family in need of rehabilitation, healing, and peace. The root word of salvation, as one of uh, my professors at Manhattan College, Sheriff Scott, once pointed out to me, is the Latin word salvus, which means wholeness or healing. In Romans 8, we have already discussed how Paul reminds us that all of creation is groaning unto the day of consummation. That every cell, every molecule, not just man and woman and beast, all of nature is bound to the laws of entropy. As William Butler Yeats put it in his poem, The Second Coming, things fall apart, the center cannot hold. And because of this, this leads to despair. It leads to Sartre and his mind musing over the futility of his life. It leads to Nietzsche frustratedly screaming against a God he doesn't believe in. God is dead, Nietzsche says, for we have killed him. And yet, the miracle, the great miracle that we see in the gift of the gospel is that God himself, the Alexander the Great of Alexander the Greats, the conqueror of conquerors, the creator who does hold all of humanity under his sway, chooses to stoop from his throne and to become a shivering child 
on the far edges of the Roman Empire, to be born not in a palace but in a stable, and then to lay out his body upon the wood of the cross. As Lewis would say, they nailed him to a tree of wood, but he made the hill on which it stood. The God reached down to elevate all of creation and reconcile us to himself. That idea is what Tolkien called eucatastrophe, the opposite of catastrophe, where things go from very great to very terribly. Instead, at the midnight hour, when all hope fades, when Gollum has bitten off the ring from Frodo's finger, along with his finger, evil ends up tripping over his own feet. Darkness is self-defeating. And so, what we see in these examples of charity and mercy and in hope is the fact that the Christian narrative is not simply a narrative that is contained within two leather pages in my pocket. Nor is it a reality simply which we will experience when we die and our soul goes up to heaven. It's a reality that is gritty and honest. It's where the rubber hits the road. And we like Lewis towards that beggar in the street. We like that minister towards joy on her deathbed. We like Alexander the Conqueror. All have the opportunity. Are we willing to say, as Christ does towards the penitent thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise? Are we willing to say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing? Or do we want to choose justice? Or rather, to be the arbiters of our own justice? Because ultimately, as Christ reminds us, the measure with which we judge, we shall be judged. In the recent adaptation of The Batman, when Robert Patterson is depicting this character that we've seen time and time again with Christian Bale and Ben Affleck, one element that Patterson nails, at least as depicted in this version, which some of the others lacked, was the fact that he reminds a woman who's seeking to avenge the death of her mother that if you kill or if you destroy to inflict harm on those who have harmed you, you simply become the monsters that you are seeking to replace. Or to quote The Who, the 1960s and 70s band, meet the new boss, same as the old boss. Let's say Gandalf was to take the ring in The Lord of the Rings. He says to Frodo, do not tempt me, for I would seek to use it to do good. But the power to use it would make me more terrible than anything you could imagine. Ultimately, it is only in the self-emptying of the self, in imitation of Christ who empties himself to the point of death on a cross, as we read in Philippians 2. Can the psyche of humanity be sane? Can love be anything more than self-gratification, but actually become a vehicle for healing? And only then can we find real and authentic happiness. Which, of course, in Greek, a dynumia, to turn to the Aristotle, means something closer to flourishing or completedness. We have more at our fingertips now than at any other generation to create aesthetical beauty. And beauty leads to the truth, it testifies to the truth. But the only way in which our art or the work of our hands will ever be good for our children and our children's children will be not if we tried to create a utopia based off of pride or of my accomplishment or of my country first or of a kind of egalitarianism in our own image but instead to realize who we were born again to be, and that is children of God. Children who are called to grow up, to deny themselves, to take up the cross, and follow love to the point where love is willing to bleed for one another. Martin Luther King Jr., before he was assassinated, 
pointed out that he might not see the promised land. He was right. He didn't see the promised land on earth yet. Instead, he had to lose his life to save it. We see in the work of Edith Stein, a Jewish convert to Christianity in the 1930s. She knew that she was going to go to the gas chambers long before they came for her. She was a very prophetic woman and left behind some of the best philosophy that we have. Her phenomenology of the cross is brilliant. And yet she realized that it was only in her willingness to let go of her life that she was able to keep it. Instead of spreading the faith of Christianity to the edge of the sword, Peter and Paul in Rome would build the church by laying down their lives as living offerings. In the book of Romans, Paul says, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Be not conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your minds. The word repentance in Greek is metanoia. It means the renewal of the mind. If that's repentance, we all need it, and we need it now. Not merely a transformation that comes from wanting to conquer the world like Alexander or Elon Musk or whoever is currently the latest on the top of the food chain, but instead being willing to become the last at the table so that all might benefit. In doing so, we discover the fullness of grace. And if you are a skeptic, know that as C.S. Lewis was once a skeptic, I encourage you to examine all the videos on this channel. I would love to engage in dialogue with you. And together, I hope to arrive at the apocalypsis, at the unveiling of the fullness of the truth, which I believe to be revealed in love incarnate. May God bless you, and I look forward to seeing you all in the comment section.